Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Hey, Jennifer, how are you? Hanging in there. How are you guys doing? Well, well, I think we're doing better than hanging in. <laughs> uh, everybody is adjusting, and we're no exceptions. Not, in, in fact, I, I think I always like to say, I realize we're all affected by this thing. So, you know, we're not unique at all, except that each family has different set of circumstances. So there are different kinds of inconveniences or frustrations or, or whatever, and we've had our own. So well, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with you today. And how are you handling the, the podcast and all this? Well, the podcast is about the only way that I can keep, that's the only normal part of my life. I haven't seen my mom for a week and a half, and she is on hospice at this point. I don't know that she's that close to the end of life. I don't know if I mentioned that she fell, she broke her leg. So, you know, she's bed bound currently. She was not at all cooperative with the physical therapist. So there's a lot of challenges there, and I can't go do anything. And I'm pretty sure that by the time I get to go back and see her, she won't remember me at all, even as being her best friend, which is what I've been for several years. And I'm very concerned that she won't trust me because I'll just be a stranger showing up again. So that's, that's a little bit hard to deal with. So I'm trying to channel those feelings of, I can't do anything to help my mom. So I'm, I'm trying to double down and do what I can for my listening community and the caregiving community at large. Well, this is, you have a good opportunity to do that. Because yeah. A lot of people who are eager to hear what's going on and, and some have very specific concerns. I'm sure that they'd like to have addressed too. I'm sure. So I know that when Kate was first, it was when she was first diagnosed, you decided that you two would do two meals out every day. Well, I, not at the absolute beginning. First of all, since our children were already gone uh, and we were, uh, she was retired. Uh, we ate out more frequently than we had, of course, in the past. That I think a lot of people end up doing that, and it was, we're no exception. But uh, after her diagnosis, uh, I really wanted to spend as much time as I could with her. And, and so to start out with, we, we ate out a little bit, but uh, I was preparing things at home. And I, you know, I had done a little bit of that before anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. But I very quickly, I, it was inconvenient to have to work on preparing dinner. Then you, we sit down in a, just at home. It wasn't very exciting. Uh, I don't mean that our home's not exciting, but you know, it's the place we live all the time. So, uh, and, and then afterwards, then I would clean up and I, I decided I wanted to escape that inconvenience. So we went, started eating out. So I did it. I was driven by convenience only to discover that the real benefit was social interaction and connection with people because every time, well, first of all, we got acquainted with the servers and I mean, they know us all over. They know our preferences. They see us in the parking lot, have drinks ready for us. It's, and the managers know us. I mean, it's, it's really an interesting thing. I, I saw something on Twitter one time, uh, I think it was something out of the UK about it was an article that said, when you're a regular, you're a VIP. And I can attest to that. It really does make a difference. So that's been powerful. But on top of that, we're in the kind of community where that's small enough that almost every time we go out, we're going to run into people we know from my business or church or uh, recreational or uh, volunteer organizations, all those kind of things. So it, it's, it's just we're right in the middle of things. So we have never been socially isolated. And so that's been the real benefit to us. So after, uh, it was about eight years ago that we really were going full time at this. So if you are calculating there, that's almost 6,000 meals we have eaten out in that time frame. <laughs> so for last week to learn that all the restaurants were closed, <laughs> that's an abrupt change in our lifestyle. Now, I'm not asking people to be sympathetic with us. <laughs> Because there, there are a lot of people who say, well, gee, with poor you, you were eating out all the time, and now you have to live like the rest of us. I understand that. It's, I'm just, it's just a reality that it is a change. And, um, but we are adapting. We're, I'd say 
we were thrown off balance. We're managing. Um, I used to use the term remarkably well. I'm now saying we're managing. We're getting along all right. Uh, and we're on our way to a new normal. Uh, and, and I think we're going to be fine. That new normal may be temporary. I don't know how long it's going to last. Nobody does. So, so we've, we've eaten out a lot and, uh, and it's had, a, you know, a number of effects of that, certainly. Uh, how is she coping with the change? Because I, I can only imagine how challenging this is for people living with Alzheimer's and dementia who are at home. You know, a nice, stable routine is beneficial to them. And now the entire world has upended itself. <laughs> so stable routines are thrown out the window. Absolutely. Well, actually, it's a good question because she and I have responded differently to this. I'm busier because of this, because I'm having to do more things. And that's why I'm, you know, I'm filling the dishwasher, washing it. I'm do, I, the garbage is filling up. I'm preparing meals. So I'm, I'm busier and plus taking care of her. She, on the other hand, is less busy. And that has a negative unintended consequence for her. Because what I have found is our pattern has been that the mornings are the roughest time of the day for her because she wakes up and often doesn't know who she is, where she is, who I am. And fortunately, she usually handles that all right. You know, she asks me where we are and, and I tell her and, and we move on. And not that she remembers it, but she feels more secure. And I've had ways of, of, of getting her to feel comfortable. The key is once she feels comfortable with things, even if she doesn't remember where she is, it just seems normal to her. Um, so, but anyway, the, and then, so the point was during the day, she's getting more and more stimulation, particularly we're eating out, we're doing things. A whole day involved very little of sitting around and doing nothing, very little. Now there's a lot more time for that for her. And what that means is she's resting. And when she wakes up, she can be confused than when she wakes up in the same way that she was in the morning. Oh, boy. So, so she's having more delusions now, more hallucinations, which she was already having anyway. So it's hard to, you know, to identify everything as strictly related to this change of being homebound. They're interconnected like so many other things. But I do feel like it's had an impact on her in that regard. And uh, she's having more negative kinds of delusions. Like, for example, she's uh, talked about killing on three different occasions. I uh, think of it. One involved uh, knowing, oh, thinking somebody was going to kill her. Another time she was feeling, feeling really guilty because she apparently had witnessed a killing or knew about a killing and had never reported it. Uh, and the third was a young man who was uh, going to be killed and we needed to do something for him. Um, and then, but most of her delusions are nice, happy ones. They, in fact, they show her kindness. They always involve helping people in some way, but it's the negative ones that bother me. And, and I've just sensed more of that in just the last 10 days or so. So that's the biggest effect on her. Otherwise, by the way, she doesn't remember that, that there's, she doesn't recognize that there's been a change. That is, she doesn't remember that we ate out. Hmm. She, she thinks that the way we're living right now is just the way we always live. So in that sense, she's getting along fine. There's no, she doesn't sense it, but there's something going on. Well, I think it's the rest, and her mind then seems to float around into a lot of different things and, and gravitate toward things that make her uncomfortable. That's really interesting. Well, you shouldn't be playing the true crime podcast for her then, apparently. <laughs> no, I think not. I think we'll stay away from that. That's just very interesting. My mom's mind goes all over the place. And I've had to learn not to attempt to figure out where she's going because I have a tendency to make the whole scrunchy, like, huh, contemplating face. And when she sees that, she gets hostile. It's really incredible. Oh. So, but I don't have to worry about it now. And I just worry about what will happen if and when I get to go back and see her. You know, they're trying to, I mean, they're doing FaceTime calls, but my mom's visual processing is so shot that, you know, you can hold up the phone to her 
and say, see, here's Jennifer. And she'd be like, oh, where? And she'd be looking everywhere. I've, I've experienced that with trying to show her, you know, cute photos of my dogs or whatever, because she loves dogs. And the executive director said, well, you know, some people are going and standing outside their loved one's windows, which one, my mom's in a hospital bed and her back's to the window so that she can see out into the hall. So that's not going to work. And two, for those of you who are familiar with Tipa Snow, she is recommending not to do that because it might cause, as she refers to it, elopement syndrome, which just means trying to escape, which is, it's, I think it's a nicer term than trying to escape. So you got to be kind of careful with that one. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with mom. Just play it day by day. Well, you know, you have to have a lot of tools in your toolbox to address these things. And, and it's like doing home fix-it things, which I'm not prone to do at all, by the way. <laughs> but so people tell me, when you do that, you always discover you need a new tool that you did. You thought you had them all, but you got to have one more. And, and that's what I experienced as a caregiver. It's, it's always something new. And fortunately, I've got a number of things that really have worked. And I, uh, uh, in fact, just this morning, just before this, she did not want to get up this morning. And that's something new in the last, oh, four weeks or so. One day she didn't get up till five in the afternoon. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, another day it was that it was uh, 3.15 on Monday of this week. And she didn't want to get up, and uh, the, the sitter was coming, and I was going to leave here and go to my office for this uh, this interview. And uh, I wanted her up, but she was just obstinate. So I'll tell you what I did. I, I put on some music, as I often do, and sort of soothe her. Then I decided it was too soothing, <laughs> too easy to stay in bed. <laughs> so I've got, a, I've got a couple of other pieces of music that I play for her. And uh, I pulled out, there's an old Doris Day um, song. Well, it wasn't her song, but she sang it, A Bushel and a Peck. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and she gets a kick out of singing that. And often we sing it together. So I got that on and put it on so it would play twice through. And we sang together in bed. And she started picking up. And uh, then after that, I put on um, a soundtrack to um, My Fair Lady. And she loves the music to that. And so, and, and I lay down in the bed with her, beside her, and just, just we just listened to music. And then during that process, you know, she ended up uh, scratching my arm. And, and, just, and by the way, she really didn't know who I was. This is one of those cases where she, now she trusted me, obviously, but she didn't know it was her husband or name, anything like that. But she started rubbing my arm, and then she laughed a little bit. Uh, she especially like, loves the uh, With a Little Bit of Luck song from My Fair Lady and loves to sing with that. And so we sang together, and then I put on children's music. I, I, I discovered this about uh, 10 days or two weeks ago, and she just loved it. And so it was like coming around the mountain when she comes, uh, uh, our the bear went over the mountain, uh, new Lord. It's just got tons of old fashioned songs. Uh, and uh, that she got to feeling really well. And I thought, well, we'll, we'll go ahead again. I said, well, I, I've ordered luncheon. Were you ready to get up for lunch? And she said, oh yeah. And then I went around the other side of the bed to help her out and she didn't want to get up. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, well, the, the food is here. I've got food. And she said, food? <laughs> And all of a sudden, instantaneously, she changed her whole position. I got her up, and, went, and we've had lunch. That's so, funny. But I'm at home. I didn't. Go, I didn't go into the office. I just stayed right here. The, the sitter's with her in another room. Well, it's nice that they're still coming. I've got a couple people I'm going to check in on. Um, what state are you in? Well, <laughs> literally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in South Carolina. Okay, that's what I meant. <laughs> Not mentally. <laughs> um, because I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I guess it was our governor two weeks ago that said, all seven counties of the San Francisco Bay Area, you're on a mandatory shelter in place. And then it was last Thursday, I went out with clients, the one and only graduation portrait I'm going to end up doing this season. 
and I was feeling really good. It was a beautiful day, bright blue sky, clouds. Um, I don't think you, well, you might know just from all my social media, but we downsized and we moved to a different house. So I don't have my attached photography studio. I don't have any of the stuff that I had before. So I'm having to, you know, flex and stretch the creative and the technical muscles. And I was really happy with what I did. And I came home and my husband said, just in time, the governor said the entire state's on mandatory shelter in place. And I was just like, are you kidding me? This is not what I needed to hear when I, I'm like, I was finally feeling a little better. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of caregivers that aren't, they're not going to people's homes because it's, you know, it's not always safe. So there's some, some people from my support group. My support group got canceled. That would have been, well, it's the second Thursday of the month. So that got canceled. Everything in my life's gotten canceled except producing the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, just in a few minutes before we got on, I saw an email uh, from our newspaper here that said the go our governor has just imposed the same uh, restriction. So uh, I, I didn't know exactly how complete that was, but I have been concerned about that. I mean, that's another adjustment about having caregivers in the home, both directions, they're concerned. I do know from the agency from uh, which I get the, these uh, sitters that a lot of, of cl their clients have canceled out. And so, because they were fearful. Uh, our sitter on Monday had nothing the left, left rest of the week. Mm. Every, I was the only one to uh, let her come in. And I only did that for a short time because of something I had to do. And uh, I have worked with the sitter here. I've had this sitter since the beginning, which is two and a half years. And I don't want to lose her. I, I mean, it's just like you're feeling about your mother. You, you've got a relationship, but if you are apart for some time, that, that tie really uh, severs a bit. So I don't want that to, to happen. Uh, and yet uh, the, the answer may be made for me by the governor. I think if they can do, I'm trying to remember where I saw this. Um, I think it was Tipa Snow had an Ask Tipa Anything like live event last week that I, because I had nothing else to do, got to watch. And these people that were going into homes like what you've got, she was recommending like, big baggy clothes over what they're, you know, like basically multiple layers so that they can remove. Okay. Here's the, you oh. know, Richard and Kate's what I wore there and they could take it off and put it in a, you know, plastic bag and go, I mean, you're going to have a ton of laundry. She said, but I'd rather have a ton of laundry than anybody around me getting this disease so that, you know, if they're willing, they might be, they might be able to do that with you know, a lot of gloves and just a lot of layers just so they're not transferring stuff from your house to somebody else's house. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, it, it's, the, it's impossible to avoid everything. But, for example, we're doing takeout meals now, some. Well, in a takeout meal, I mean, people have handled the meal. And uh, so you don't know what you're doing there. And of course, there's still, we aren't going in places. People do come out to deliver the meal. So it's not right. about going to the door, but there's still a possibility of, of transfer of things. And uh, I, there is one place we actually walk in the door and they've set up so that you can sign the check there and, and whatever, move on. Yeah, so. my husband goes, well, he has it since Friday. We have a, a franchise extreme pizza that my husband was going to daily almost, which not good, but, and they have lots of different beers. And so he went and he bought bottles of beer and then he brought home um, a pizza. You know, we're trying to help this guy stay in business because he recently in the last year bought a second franchise up in a college community. So yikes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, but it's like, there's only so many, it's like, we did, I don't eat out that much. And my workouts, like our gym is closed. I'm, I'm about ready to just say the hell with it and go out on my bike by myself. Cause I, the walking the dogs is getting really old. We have, we have three, one is almost three, one's five and a half and one is 12, a little over 12. And he's got some bad arthritis. So there are days we can walk far and days we don't get to walk too far. And 
reason I was running behind this morning is because he was really slow. <laughs> Come on. We got to get back to the house, buddy. So it's crazy. It's just the whole thing is insane. And I just, I feel, I feel, I feel bad for people like me who cannot be with, you know, I can't even go check on my mom. I can't, I can't see if this fall and the broken bone has accelerated her decline. There's some indications it might, other indications that no, it probably hasn't. So that's kind of confusing. But I know, let's see, there, one, of the, one of the gals from my support group takes care of her dad, who's 93, I believe, 92 or 93. And he has Lewy body dementia. And he gets kooky when there's a full moon, which I don't know when that's coming back. But both of them got sick back in November, December. So he had not gone to the adult social day program and she was about ready to tear out her hair because <laughs> he was driving her bananas and I know it's closed. So I don't know what she's doing. She's one of the people I'm going to check in on. And Well, the things you're saying are the very reasons that I say we're really fortunate in our circumstances. We're inconvenienced. And in fact, the, the worst thing is happening is what I told you about Kate and that is, the, the that negative consequence of having the delusions and, and confusion more than normal. But otherwise, we're really getting along and we're going to adapt. So I'm not worried about that. But the people like you who have a loved one who is locked up someplace and you can't get to them. Uh, you know, I see the, the tweets uh, about things like this and, you know, it's heartbreaking. To, to see what's what's going on. So we, uh, as I think I told you the last time we, we chatted, we have been fortunate in just about every way that we can be fortunate except the diagnosis. Um, and I, I recognize that and I try really hard, not well, in fact, I think I'm successful. I just don't go to somebody and say, listen, if you do, I've, here's what I've been doing. If you would do this, you'll be all right. Because a lot of the things that I've done, some other people simply cannot do either from a financial standpoint or a situational standpoint or from their own interest and skills or, or the relationship they have. Kate and I are very fortunate in terms of the relationship we have. And by the way, speaking, this is relevant in terms of your mother. I've thought a lot about the relationship between a, two spouses and a relationship between a parent and child. And there are some real differences. It's, it's like everything else, though. It's hard to generalize. Uh, you know, if, if for a while I was thinking there's a closeness in that marital relationship that is it's just a different kind of bond than with the parent and child. And, and uh, it's been tougher for me to go through this experience with Kate than it was for my own parents. On the other hand, I know other people who have haven't had a different kind of relationship with their parents. I mean, I, we had a good relationship with our, our, our parents, both of us, but it wasn't as, I don't know this, I don't know what the word is, as a, a tight, loving relationship that, that was almost more like a marital relationship. Between yeah, it's different. Parents. It's definitely, the more people I've talked to, the more I realize, like, my mom and I had a good relationship. I mean, we weren't super close. But, you know, we weren't distant either. I mean, I, I would just say we we're like normal, whatever that means these days. <laughs> <laughs> that goes a long way, doesn't it? And, but what I've noticed is the difference between like spouses caring for each other and a child caring for their parent is even, you know, my mom is, and we've talked about this, you know, in Twitter chats, she, she, she's... I think she has atypical late stage syndrome because I think she's going to talk until she dies. And I said she was going to walk, you know, she's going to walk and talk and then be gone, which, you know, most people, they lose their language. I don't think she's going to lose it. It's just, she's just got words. She strings together and it sounds like a sentence, but it makes no sense even to me. Yeah. But there's this, it just seems like there's this expectation. She still wants to help and take care of other people and, 
you know, my, I'm trying to train my husband not to say, don't worry about it. Cause that's what she would tell me. Oh, don't worry about it. That was, that was her response to a lot of things. You know, you'd say, well, do you want iced tea or diet Coke? Oh, don't worry about it. You have whatever you want. I'm okay. Blah, blah, blah. It looks like, do you want diet Coke or iced tea? For the love of God, just give me an answer. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> but she, you know, she doesn't want her kids to take care of her. I know that. And, you know, my sister and I don't quote unquote take care of her because she does live in a memory residence, but obviously there's still a lot of things that we do and I'm the healthcare DPOA. So I do a lot more of the quote unquote care because I'm the one taking her to the doctor and all that insanity. And, you know, so I, I think the difference is, is like, she doesn't want me to take care of her. You know, she, she still thinks she needs to be in charge of things. Lord, that's caused enough problems. So there's that that tension, that parent-child tension that I don't think you always get as spouses. Now, my mom is really good about rambling on about, quote-unquote, her husband, and it's rarely positive. I mean, sometimes it's neutral. Oh, well, we have dinner, and we do this, and da-da-da-da-da-da, and it's, it's really hard to repeat what she says because it's just, <laughs> I can figure it out, but it's very hard to repeat. And then she'll talk, you know, then she she turns to the negative and my dad wasn't able to be patient and caring with her. He had his own chronic illnesses and he was never a super patient person to start with. And he, I, he did the best he could. He read books. He never went to a support group. He didn't take up my suggestion on an adult social, you know, social day program, but I've read books like Helene's and I've talked to people like you and people that have gone a different path on this journey and they have a lot better outcome. And I'm like, I'm, I'm beginning to see there's just some ways to, if you can start in a more loving, positive manner when you're first diagnosed, even if it's not how you guys have been before, I think that might make the end easier, but you know, it's obviously very easy to look backwards and go, Oh yeah, we should have done it like that. Sure, sure. Well, you see, that again is how we've been fortunate because uh, we both are conflict avoiders. Neither one of us likes conflict. And we, each of us wants to please the other. And that's been true for our whole marriage. And, and it really has continued now. Now, the, there are real exceptions to that. She is more irritable now. And I, I hate using the word irritable because, I mean, I think it's a, a, the way she interprets things and she just responds. Well, you know, we, we pe talk about the filters being off mm -hmm. somebody who's got dementia. It's no longer do the, does she say something really nice and no, could I do this later? You know, she, she's comes back with a much firmer <laughs> response. And then, then frequently she realizes it. And then she apologizes. Tears will come to her eyes and she'll apologize. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. So it's, it's remarkable, uh, the, her insight to that, to her self-awareness. Yeah, that's interesting because I know she and my mom are kind of in the same sp stage, sort of. I mean, it's hard to compare, but my mom, well, my mom was always super independent, very dependent on my dad because she stayed home and took care of my sister and I, just terrific. And, but very ornery and very independent. And the filter being off of ornery and independent is not fun. Not a good thing. No. And I am very much, you know, I always, well, my mom raised me and I always felt like all of us should be able to take care of ourselves. If we get married or have, you know, a long-term relationship and somebody can help, that's great. But you never know what'll happen. Look at what's going on right now. You know, my husband is a real estate broker. Oh. And he's starting to go bananas, I think, because they had to basically shut down the MLS so that people would stop trying to show houses. I mean, he has nothing to do. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And so I, I, I was harassing him. I'm like, well, at least not one of us still working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't make money doing this, but not really. <laughs> but um, we're still working, still, you know, connecting with people. But it's just it's you never know what'll happen and i i don't worry about it but i can see how my independent i'll take care of it myself i'm an adult 
you know, I should be able to do things, you know, I should be able to handle my own stuff, not being a beneficial trait if I had cognitive issues down the line. Right, right. So it's, it's going to be interesting. Well, I think uh, I posted something on Twitter that you may have seen the other day about I, I'm increasingly feeling that parents should take more initiative in, in planning for the end of life and specifically transitioning their children and, and working, first of all, teaching them things that they need to know, but also uh, transitioning and working with them as a team so that when the day comes, there aren't, well, maybe you can minimize the spats that occur about driving or moving or whatever it is because these things come up. And because we've done so much parent care before, I've been sensitized to that and have not, in fact, neither my wife nor I has wanted our own children to take care of us the way we did for our parents. Uh, and not because we, you know, we would do it again for our parents, but we just don't want to encumber their lives in that way if there's a way for us to make it easier. And so we're trying to do that. And we, our children know, you know, I mean, they know who our doctors are, our prescriptions, they know the attorney, they know the bankers, they, they know our wishes about uh, where we're going to live. In fact, I consulted with them before we made a decision on a continuing care retirement community to make sure they, they understood why I thought that was a good idea. And, and they were completely supportive. And, and, but it, it works better that way when you're a team than when a child has to be forced into asking for the keys or saying, you got to move or, or whatever. Yeah, that doesn't go too well because – you know, well, none of us like to be told what to do. We certainly don't want our children to tell us what to do. And I'm, my, I have a little bit of a mission is when I, when I read that the statistic that 70% of us will need care before we die, that's a lot. That's 70%, that's seven out of 10. That is a lot of people. So we need, I'm a Gen Xer. So I'm talking to the Gen Xers right now. We need to just stop with this. You know, I'm going to live in my home forever. My husband and I sold our forever home. It was a single story, wide hallways, quiet, beautiful home, beautiful view, too big. Mortgage was horrendous. And, you know, we, I'm sorry, world, we were preparing for the recession of 2021. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I feel like I caused this by trying to plan ahead. <laughs> but he and I have we've discussed this we're we're in a temporary air quotes on the word temporary we're renting until the real estate market comes down which we weren't expecting to do that in the first two months of having made this change one of the things that i want to do is buy a one acre parcel of land now remember i'm in northern california so that is not terribly cheap and put two homes on it we have one child our daughter and our almost son-in-law so whatever is ours will end up theirs. So I'm like, let's put two houses on one lot, you know, opposite corners, yard in between. So everybody has their privacy. And that way, you know, if we need a little bit more, not hands-on, but a little bit more checking in on, it would be easy for them. But I also am fully aware of the benefits of an assisted living community because then we don't have to worry about cooking or cleaning or taking care of the yard or the car you know, you just go to the dining room or you go, you, you go on the trips that they, they plan or you can, you can pay, I believe, to, have, to be transported certain places. I mean, it's just like my grandmother will be 102 in three days, lives on her own, mostly blind, mostly deaf, makes me insane because I know she would love the assisted living. I mean, there would be an adjustment because she's lived in a single family home forever, but she would, she would thrive on having the security that there's always somebody there to help her. If she needs it. There's somebody at her beck and call when she wants it. You know, it's just, she'd thrive, but it just, she it's won't have it. not, a, it won't even consider it. And then, I, you know, it, when I talk to people about her, it makes me crazy because I worry about her, but I can't take on two old ladies. It's like, oh, yeah. 
My aunt and, and the two remaining sons have to deal with her, my, both my aunts. One son is in Southern California and Idaho, so he's not close. So the aunt that is up here has been significantly burdened by her needs, and she's got a friend who's much, everybody's much younger than 102. <laughs> but she, um, you know, she's got this friend that drives her around, and it's just, you know, I don't think she realizes it really sucks up a huge amount of your life. When I take my mom to the doctor, that idiot doesn't realize that, you know, I have to leave my house drive over to get her and I got to leave a, a lot enough time. So if she's having a good day or a bad day, we still get to the doctor on time and I got to keep her calm while we wait for them. Now their office is pretty good about not keeping people waiting, but that's also because they don't spend any time with anybody and then, you know, deal with the doctor and then drive her back. The last time it was three hours. I'm like, you know, it's a good thing I work for myself and I can rearrange my life at the last minute to do these doctor appointments. But, you know, it's a lot, even with her being in a care facility, there are still a lot of things that suck up my time. And so I get a little bit nuts that people are like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to die in my home. I'm going to live here forever. And it's like, Pfft. I mean, I like the show Property Brothers Forever Home, but oh yeah, I always say, be careful about calling it forever home. Cause I had one of those for almost 13 years and we sold it. Oh, and man. now we can walk to downtown. Not that there's anything going on in downtown right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, we're supposed to have music in the park that starts June 12th. I don't know if that's going to start. It's like the whole reason for being in this particular part of town and Brentwood is about 65,000 people. It's like 15 square miles. It's, it's a small city was to to try out a different lifestyle do we like to walk to the to downtown to dinner do we like to walk to the park or the farmer's market that opened right before the whole thing blew up yeah. it's insane it's like i don't know i'm trying to do one day at a time i'm a planner so it's very difficult to you know not think about okay well here's today and i got you know i i try to plan things out a week or two and now it's like pff, i'm trying not to plan anything <laughs> It's well, depressing. Tell me how you feel about that. <laughs> I said, tell me how you feel about that. Yeah, it's, well, <laughs> the other reason for downsizing was we kept trying to grow his business to, to meet our, our expenses. And we finally said, this is really stupid. Let's just jettison some of the expensive stuff and, and make, make the expenses meet the, in, the baseline income. This is a problem when you're self-employed. And then by doing that, I was able to, well, I was supposed to attend a conference to a week and a half ago, our Rotary Ride for Veterans, which was April 18th is canceled. The district conference for our Rotary group, that was the end of April is canceled. And then just to make last week really great, the trip to Hawaii for two weeks that we've paid for and we're bringing the kids, the Rotary International Convention in Hawaii is canceled. And now they're postponing the Olympics. So it's like, I'm only going to think about 36 hours in advance at this point. <laughs> <laughs> That's my coping technique right now. It's like, I'm, I'm frustrated because one of the reasons for downsizing was, you know, so we didn't have to work as much. And now that's all I get to do. And he's, the, he's vacuuming. <laughs> You know, by the way, you, you're making me think of, of something I haven't said at all, but uh, I'd still own a business, even though I'm retired. And I have three people who work for me, and they're working from home right now during this process. But it's, it's one of those things that could end up being a more permanent situation, because a lot of people are thinking about virtual whatever employment for whatever you're doing. And actually, I had suggested to them at the office, uh, well, more than three years ago, that they might think about doing just that, that uh, we, we outsource everything we do now so that we don't need the, the space that we had before. And we already had downsized, but they, they, they've got more than they really need. Uh, and they could easily work from home and do, do the same stuff. Uh, so this may, this may be the uh, catalyst to accomplish that. Well, I'm glad that I am 53 with my other grandmother lived to 91 with significant cognitive impairment. 
So you guys are stuck with me for a long time. Just get over it. And I'm very, cause I, before the whole coronavirus happened, my daughter who, like I said, she's 28. She's politically a little bit more progressive than I am. We don't necessarily have the same candidate that we like, although all the ones I liked are gone. So whatever. And I was explaining to her cause she was grumping about politics. And I said, you don't seem to understand because you're 28 and I'm 53. We are at the very beginning of a cultural shift in this country that I don't think is going to stop. And I said, I'm glad that I am old enough to see that that's happening and I'll probably be around long enough to see what ends up happening. And that's one of the things I read recently is lots of employers were very reluctant to allow a lot of this teleworking and and whatever virtual work you whatever we want to call it virtual working doesn't sound like actual working and i think that's all going to change and i think that'll be better for our our selves you know people will be commuting less they'll be spending more time with their kids and their spouses they might have more time to help their parents deal with things i i just as ugly as it is right now and as confusing and hard as it is i really think i think there was some cultural shifts happening and this virus just drop kicked that one into i think it'll be a maybe not high gear but medium gear i think we're going to see changes faster yeah it's a major uh, disruption in in the system and and by the way yeah my wife and i were talking the other day well she didn't think of it this way but we were babies young children during world war ii Uh, i was born in 1940 she 41 uh so that was a a disruptive period of time, but we didn't feel it at all. It, it doesn't, and we can't remember anything. Right. I remember a, a victory in Europe day you know, when the war was over there. But uh, this particular event is the biggest single crisis that in in our lifetime, and the changes I think are going to be momentous. And and they're already happening. You know, for example, how about Zoom? How do you have any Zoom stock? No, but I probably should have bought some. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you know that that just this week, I've got two buddies, one in Denver, one in in South Carolina. Uh, We're in constant contact, I should say constant, regular daily contact by email. And uh, one of them suggested we get together on Zoom, that 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 might be a nice thing to do. Uh, The same day, I had uh, two United Way meetings rescheduled that they will be on Zoom now. <laughs> and there's going to be a whole lot more of this kind of thing. So their, their business is really going. Yep. Um, let's see. I've been using Zoom since October of 2018. And our Rotary Club, which is slightly over 100 members, we had our first virtual Rotary meeting this week. There was 50 people online with Zoom. So that was really interesting. <laughs> we managed to do pretty good considering, you know, our current president is a tax preparer. And so I've been teasing him that he uh, he pulled the plug on our club meeting so he had more time for tax preparation. But now he has more time because that's been postponed to July, except for the state taxes. That's different. And, you know, it's like, it's kind of hard to have a test run with 50 people. So it was, it was interesting and it was kind of fun. I, you know, it helped cause it was like, okay, this is at least a little piece of my normal Monday. And then we were done and I'm like, well, normally after a rotary, I go see my mother. <sighs> okay. So I just, I think I worked. <laughs> do, you, do you know about the sofa singers? No, I don't. Oh, this is, I think, a clever, clever idea. This is a a choral director in the UK uh, decided to put together, in essence, it's a a virtual choir. That sounds Uh, cool. And and it happened as a result of the coronavirus. I mean, his idea was to connect people, and and singing is something that people can really enjoy. And, And this, as I understand it, it may have some really good singers, maybe professional singers, but, but this is an open kind of thing. So anybody who wants to join can join. Uh, and they connect and on Friday at 3.30, at least last week it was Friday at 30, uh, 3.30, they had a choir rehearsal. That's what they do. And they sing. He, he has the music. Apparently you look on screen, you've got the, some music to read. 
uh, and then you can see pictures of people. You know, of course, they're going to be tiny little pictures because there are a lot of people. I couldn't get on it this day. I tried, but they had oversubscribed it, and there was no room. So I, I don't know what kind of software they're using, but it wasn't enough to handle uh, the large crowd. And I, since then, it's been I've seen it uh, promoted in several different articles, and suspect that uh, they're going to have a huge number of singers around the world. Well, I will Google that. That is cool. And I will share that on my social media too. There's a lot of um, musicians doing Instagram story concerts or something. I've just been reading. My husband and I were working on a puzzle of um, New York City. He's from New York City. Well, he's from Staten Island originally. So um, we have, we're, we've, we're tag teaming this puzzle because I'm really good at sorting all the pieces by various shades of color and he's good at putting them all together, so we're working on that. Just hanging in there, walking dogs, trying well, different food. Well, when you have lots of problems, there are a lot of creative ideas out there, and uh, some of them fly, a lot of them don't, but uh, it, it does uh, lead to a lot of innovation. That is so true. People, like I said, I'm pretty sure we're at a pretty – I think this is. they're going to look back and say this – this 2020 started this huge cultural shift. Yes, that's right. And, you know, relating it back to caregiving, I, I, we have, we're faced with that same kind of dilemma on a day-in, day-out basis. Something that worked yesterday doesn't seem to work today, uh, but may work tomorrow. But you've got to have something else. So, we, I, you know, we keep trying and trying and trying. And sometimes we win and sometimes we don't. And, uh, I, Fortunately, as I say, uh, for Kate and me, we have won more times than we've lost. So uh, I hope that keeps up for a while. But uh, it's uh, she's she's getting toward the well. She, as you know, she's at stage seven now, and then she is the aphasia is coming, and her mobility is going, and and she will probably go directly from walking to a wheelchair because she's not mentally capable of manipulating a walker. Uh, so yeah when I was talking to the surgeon about mom's leg basically she slipped and fell on her knee and so the the leg bone right under her kneecap is in three pieces now it required a cat scan to actually see it the um, x-ray showed nothing so in my non-medical world to me that sounds like Yes, there are three pieces, but they're, it's not like big chunks. When I broke my collarbone, a blind person could see on the x-ray how bad it was. So that's kind of how I'm equating it. When we were discussing, you know, he asked me, did she use a walker or a cane before? And I said, oh, no, she was perfectly mobile. Her biggest problem was, you know, what her brain, what her eyes would see, her brain would translate into like God knows what. And so she was always a tentative walker, but physically she could, she could hike forever if she wanted to. And when we were discussing, do we do the surgery, which we didn't. And, you know, cause I didn't think she'd do the physical therapy. And I'm like, I'm okay if she's in a wheelchair because one, she does get combative and there's already somebody in her residence that uses her cane as a weapon. We don't need two of them swinging canes around trying to crack people's skulls open. That's just, you, know, <laughs> you got to stay away from that lady if she's upset. Um, and I said, and I don't think she, like you said, I don't think she has the mental capacity to manipulate a cane for sure. I think it would be out a walker maybe, but I've seen a lot of the other residents leave their walkers and wander off. And the poor staff is chasing them with the walker. Like, ah, you gotta have your walker, and it's yeah, like, right. you know, they're trying to prevent a fall. So, I saw all of that, you know, let negative type, you know, circumstances. So, I'm like, I'm fine, you know, as long as I'm like, I've watched Tipa Snows transferring people in and out of cars with in a wheelchair. I'm like, as long as she trusts me to help her from seated to the chair or the bed to the chair, we'll be fine. I said, we can have fun. But I'm not sure what's going to happen at this point, so we'll just have to wait and see. Well, that's what we're doing with a lot of things in our lives right now, is wait and see. Well, good luck with your mandatory shelter in place. You can well, walk outside. Just keep the six-foot distance. <laughs> and 
you know, it's going to be tough while you, you guys are south of me, but man, as soon as it warms up, people are going to start, it's going to be hard to stay inside. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, we already have neighbors walking around the neighborhood. I see and as we've been talking, I've seen them passing by and I would be out there too. Uh, well, in fact, with the sitter here, I actually could, <laughs> Nor you know what I normally do. I walk inside the house. Yeah. You told me that. That may seem crazy, but I, I do it. That's good for you, especially if you're eating, you were eating all those meals in restaurants. I don't know how you guys aren't huge. Did you share? Oh, we, we split a lot of meals. Oh, okay. Yeah. That helps a lot. Yes, yes. And so many restaurants serve a lot of food. But, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it varied by the restaurant. But uh, yes, my wife now has gained a lot of her. I mean, she was, uh, when we married, she was 95 pounds. He's uh, 178 now. Uh, so she's gained a lot of weight. And by the way, one of the sad things with her is that she occasionally looks in the mirror and she said, I look old. Oh, oh you know, she, it, yeah, it really kills her. She's very honest about things. You know, for example, I may have told you, she, I, she'll say something to me that you're, you're a nice guy, but you're not, you're not very handsome. <laughs> And, and she, you know, she's just as, so I joke with her about it periodically. About it. We're looking at old pictures. I say, you know, that was before I got to be handsome. She's so, oh, she has a fit with that. She's, yeah, she really likes to be honest, or at least she likes me to, to she likes to be honest with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, goodness. So, well, anyway, I, I'm glad that we can smile uh, over some of these things uh, in the midst of what really is a very, very serious problem. But I think uh, my dad was like that. I admired him for his uh, his outlook well and well. He lived to be 100. Uh, Whew. That's uh, saying something back in his time, too, which that sounds really bad, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Though. You're, you're quite right. And, when you know, by the time he was 90, almost all of his peers were gone, uh, but had a few. But after 95, I don't think he had any of his former peers. And, but fortunately, he made friends with people my age and some younger. In fact, he ended up getting a, having a significant other who was a year and a half younger than I am. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh, boy, who, by the way, had vascular dementia. So she was Oh, another, dear. She was another one that we <laughs> needed to care for. That one was uh, a short live situation. She died of cancer, actually. Mm. And so that prevented her having a longer uh, disease. Yeah. Which is probably a blessing. Sounds terrible, but probably a blessing. Yes, absolutely. And Sarah, Sarah, uh, Kate's mother lived with us five and a half years uh, without being able to talk much at all and was bedridden for almost all of that. Uh, the caregivers got her up from each of her meals. She came to the table for every three meals a day. And I should sit out on the patio and whatnot. But uh, the last, you know, I don't want Sarah to have to, Kate, that is, to go through that. I get confused, as you can tell. Uh, my, my friends tell me that too, <laughs> in my emails even. <laughs> So at any rate, I uh, thank you for uh, call, calling me again. You're welcome. Thanks uh, for kind of filling everybody in on how you guys are coping. I'm going to try to check in with more people and let's see what I do with it. It, yeah. it helped me feel better today, so that's good. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm doing like other things. You know, I'm, I'm taking out. I'm learning how to order online. And I'm learning. That, I mean, in fact, there's some good things about that. Uh, I like being able to tip online, have the whole thing. And the guy just comes up and rings the doorbell and your food's there. The food isn't as good, but it's, I mean, That's it, true. It, it wilts a good bit by the time it gets there. Well, I'm sure they appreciate that you're still ordering food and helping them put a few, few dimes in their pocket. I am sure they are. I'm sure they are. Well, all right. Best wishes to you. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing other uh, tweets and keeping up with you. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care, Jennifer. Bye now.